Section 5 of The Sins of Hollywood by Ed Roberts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gold Digger and the Wife. He is famous now, this comedian. Famous and rich. Children of all ages laugh in joyful glee at his screen antics. His salary extends into the thousands per year, for he is one of the greatest in his line. But it was not always thus. Time was when he was a plugger, a worker in another line of endeavor, a newspaper man. Happily married was this comedian whom we shall call Perry. He stayed at home those days and employed the society of his loving wife and happy little child, his daughter. Through the years of struggling for a livelihood, fighting off the specter of debt which followed in the wake of the birth of their daughter, the wife was ever at his side cheering him, praising him, helping him to make a success in life. That was her job. She was a helpmate. Then he became a motion picture actor. At first he was only ordinary and commonplace. But his trained newspaper sense showed him that many comedians who were funny were overlooking some important features, ideas which make for fun on the screen. Gags, the comedians call them. So Perry began to try out new stunts, gags. From the first, he was successful in his new idea. His employers saw that he had something, and they permitted him to spend all the money he required to properly put over his stunts. And soon, he became known as a real comedian, not because of his acting, for he is not an actor but for the reason that his gags were novel and new. Soon, his head became slightly enlarged. He was becoming famous. His letters to his wife, who still remained in New York, became more and more infrequent. He was so busy. There came to the lot one day a dark-haired, fair-skinned girl of say, twenty years. Her smile, to Perry, was infectious. She had a way about her, and indeed she had. The way had become a habit with her. She had employed it for many years for just the purpose of decoying men to do her bidding. She was clever. None can gainsay that. It was no trick at all for her to ingratiate herself in the good graces of the comedian, and at once she became his leading woman. She was a comedian. She admitted it to Perry, and he believed her. In time, he bought her a handsome light blue car, a limousine. Perry was her slave. He visited her apartments. Virtually, he lived there, day and night. A paid chauffeur drove her to the studio. Perry drove a nondescript car. Of course, they did not arrive at the studio together. That would be too crude. Back in New York, a little woman began to eat her heart out. The cry of mate for mate went out across the continent. But Perry heard it not. His tiny daughter, now a beautiful young girl, sent tearful messages to her daddy. But Perry ignored those appeals. Came the time for action. The wife had been receiving a fairly liberal allowance, but no endearing words from her now famous husband. She wondered why. Later, she wondered why her allowance was being gradually cut down. The little daughter, too, 
now old enough to see that her mother was terribly worried and sad, wondered. She tried vainly to cheer her saddened mother, to tell her that Daddy would come home some day, or perhaps send for them, and they would all be happy together once more. But the long days dragged themselves out, and no word came from the comedian. True, a small check occasionally drifted along, but nothing accompanied them. No words of love for the wife and little one. The wife could stand it no longer. She decided that once and for all, she must find out what the trouble was, what influence was turning her own lawful husband against her and their baby. So she packed up, and with her daughter, they came to Hollywood. Vainly did she try to get on the lot where her comedian husband was employed. The gatekeeper had his instructions, for she had wired that she was coming. Yes, she had telegraphed Perry, but he did not meet her at the train. The little daughter mingled her tears with those of her mother that night in the gloomy hotel room. Telephone calls received no response. Perry was not at home. Then it began to dawn upon the wife of the comedian that he was deliberately turning her down, flaunting her love. The wife learned of a noted attorney, a lawyer who knew all the movie folks, for they were his clients, many of them. To this attorney she went. The gruff old lawyer's heart was touched at the pathos of it all. He knew the kind of man Perry was, of his philandering, of his infatuation for his leading woman. So he sent for Perry. Perry came at the lawyer's bidding. Many of the film workers do. They know what he knows. They are afraid not to answer when he beckons. Perry came and met his loving wife and his tearful daughter at the gruff but kind-hearted lawyer's office. Joyfully did the little girl bounce to the side of her daddy. Daddy! Oh, my daddy! she cried, throwing her arms about the comedian's neck. Roughly the comedian loosed the tiny arms that encircled his neck. Then he turned to his wife, the wife he had promised to love and cherish, the wife who had helped him when he needed help most. The woman stood aghast at his actions. It was incredible. Uh, still nagging, I see, he said sneeringly. Still hounding me? Well, what do you want? The wife fell upon her knees before the comedian begged him, for the sake of the baby, to make a home for them, to love them, to live with them. But he turned away from her, whistling. Let's get it over with, he said to the lawyer. What does this woman want? She wants, and we intend to get, all that is coming to her, in money, answered the attorney. She wants your love and your kindness. She wants a father for her daughter. She wants a home. But this she sees now she cannot have. She wants happiness, and you are denying her that. So she must have money to properly bring up your daughter and hers. Well, how much? the comedian asked. I'm not a millionaire, you know. It cost me a lot of money to live here. We know your salary. Never fear. We'll get what she wants, in our own way, unless you see fit to be fair right now. The comedian did not see fit to be fair, but before he left the attorney's office, he had paid. Paid in hard coin, and he is still paying. And he will continue to pay 
for the contract is iron-bound and certain. That is the kind of contracts the lawyer draws, because he knows some of the movie folks for what they are. Tear-stained faces now peer from the windows of their apartments in New York. Two saddened hearts beat dully, yet occasionally with a faster beating of hope. For some day, maybe, Daddy will see the error of his ways and come home. Some day, maybe. For Lucy, as she shall be called, now has the upper hand. She is what is termed in Hollywood a gold digger. She has extracted every dime she can from the comedian. Her rent, her car, her jewels, her clothes, her pleasures. But even to the man who has brought her all these, she oftentimes is not at home. And why? Because oftentimes other men are there. Men she has lured. Men who are fond of her charms. Men who do not leave her apartment until daybreak. And later. Every now and then she makes a trip to New York. Fatigued from being too closely wedded to her art. She needs a change. And Perry pays the bills as she flits in and out of the Tenderloin's mazes. Her face is familiar in every hotel lobby on Broadway. She has many telephone calls, many midnight suppers. Perry pays for these jaunts to the same city where a little fatherless girl sits and waits with her face pressed against the pane, waits alone for her daddy, who never comes. Every day, Perry talks to Lucy from Los Angeles. If he fails to reach her, he comes home sick. She disappeared for two days on her last trip, and they had to get a doctor for Perry. His assistant and his yes-men were sorry for him, so they tried to frame lying excuses. But they knew where she was, and under their breaths, they cursed her. Finally, she wrote and said she was not coming back. The going was too good in New York. So after a couple of weeks of illness, during which he was under the doctor's care, the doctor knew what he needed and didn't tell him. Perry went to work with a new leading woman. His friends and faithful assistants were happy. Perry was cured. He was through with Lucy, through with his parasite. But they did not know Lucy. When she tired of New York, she came back, smiled at Perry, and the next morning, the new leading woman was fired. Lucy resumed her place as sole occupant of the harem. That evening, she recounted to a group of laughing and screaming studio pals the wonderful time she had in New York. She told of all the men she had met and set the bunch roaring with glee again and again as she retold her adventures. Lucy enjoyed playing the wanton, and her friends enjoyed hearing about it. Yes, she is wanton, Wanton and cruel and selfish. Think not that she entertains other men because she is so fond of their society, because she is a man's woman. No, she is just a gold digger. Perry's money is good, but it is not enough. She wants more, always more. And then Perry may be a great comedy star, but he is not much for looks. She wants more and more and more, and that is her way of getting it. Soon, Lucy will be rich. For in proportion as their men grow poorer, 
the gold digger grows richer. And back in New York, with her little face pressed against the pane, a little girl waits and watches. Alone she waits for her daddy, who never comes. And a lone woman dreams of the days when she was the helpmate, the happy wife of a poor newspaper artist, and in her heart curses the hour motion pictures came into being. But some time, some day, there may come a familiar step, and with a great joy that will fill their tender hearts to overflowing, they will dash down the stairs and fall into the arms of their daddy, if he sees the light in time. In time. But of course, that will only be when Lucy gets ready. End of section five.